again, Frank. You always do such a good job of playing Jesus at the Christmas play. Ain't no problem. Let my agent know if you have any more gigs for me. Ooh! Hey, watch it, pal. Me? You ran into me, pal. Back off, birthday boy. I've had a long day at the mall and I am done with people. Oh, you better back off, tubby. It's called padding, ugly. What's your excuse? All right, Saint Nick, you asked for it. I got your milk and cookies right here. Oh, yo, you know what? I'm gonna put you in a grave a second time. You know what I mean? <laughs> And the Christmas is forgiving. It's great to be back in Canada. A couple, about a week in Greece, visiting some of the missions projects that we support as a church. And A21, one of those projects, the anti-human trafficking campaign. So it was a really great opportunity, but it's always so good to be home. It's so lovely hearing English again in my head. And, um, but you know what, before we jump into our new series this morning, in, uh, you know, in light of the upcoming season, we wanted to, uh, we got a little video today to share with you some gift giving tips that will help you as you are getting ready for Christmas. So why don't we watch this afternoon? Go ahead and roll it, media. Oh, hey everyone, Jose La Bamba right here for you. Christmas is just around the corner, which means it's time to get ready for one of the most important parts of the holiday season, regifting. I'm gonna give you the top five rules of regifting. Numero uno, do not regift items that have already been opened or used. How would you like it if somebody gives you an open puzzle with missing pieces, or, or a four pack of underwear with only three pairs in it? I know what you would say, ha, <laughs> no way, Jose. Numero dos, do not re-gift a one-of-a-kind item. Maybe your little nephew made you an ashtray out of Play-Doh, or your grandma knit you a bra made out of steel wool with your initials on it. It doesn't matter, you know, how useless or ugly it is, you just can't give that stuff away. And numero tres, examine any gift carefully for cards or notes. One time when I was a little niño, my aunt gave me a nice pair of fluffy mittens. When I went to put them on, I found a note inside that said, Happy Birthday Encarnacion. My aunt's name is Encarnacion. Not cool, auntie, not cool. Numero cuatro. Do not re-gift to somebody in the same social group in which you has received the gift. Remember that Deer Mask shower gel collection that your secret Santa Iris from accounting gave you at last year's office Christmas party? Don't try to pawn it off this year, because if Iris sees it, she'll know, and she controls your face stubs. Numero cinco, you gotta dress it up. Anything can look new and original if you rewrap your regif. And if you is a terrible rapper like Drake, there's always another option, gift bags. Remember these helpful tips, because nothing says, I hope you like this present better than I did when I received it, like re-gifting. Feliz Navidad, everybody. To re-gift or not to re-gift, that is the question. Uh, maybe you are, actually those are like legit re-gifting tips. So you can actually follow those and that will help you with re-gifting etiquette. But um, you know, the series that we're coming into, it really does connect to the season. A season where re-gifting might not be appreciated or really badly blundered. There actually is a gift that can be re-gifted that will be cherished and that you don't have to worry about re-gifting etiquette rules that apply. And you know what, that's why the series Christmas is Forgiving, it's about re-gifting the greatest gift. Re-gifting the greatest gift. Let's say that together, Christmas is Forgiving. Christmas is forgiving. No, I know we don't usually associate Christmas with forgiveness because that's usually what Easter is about, true? It's, and you know, but actually, Forgiveness is really at the heart of Christmas. And it's because it's what, what's what we celebrate is when God initiated reconciliation with us. 
In other words, God himself came to the earth in the form of a baby who grew into a man who would reunite God's family back together again. And this is what we're, this is what we're looking at in this series about this wonderful gift because God made himself the most epic gift. He made himself the most amazing gift except in John 1.11 it says he came to his own people but they didn't want him. In other words, God became the unwanted gift. You know that, like those unwanted gifts that you give that you try to re-gift. God himself, it's like God himself set himself up to become the re-gifted gift. God himself set himself up to become a gift that be, would be re-gifted and that was actually his plan. Because see, there's something really specific in what he came to be and what he came to do that he wants us to give to others, that he wants to be regifted. Everyone say Christmas is forgiving. Christmas is forgiving. Now this, this, this whole subject of forgiveness, I know it can be somewhat of a difficult subject this time of year because, you know, this time of year, this is when memories kind of, you know, they, they get heightened. You're, you're in situ, you're in, you know, situations where it's like family or you're, you know, Christmas is a lot about, oh, tradition. You remember a lot of things and sometimes those memories aren't so great, you know, and sometimes it's you're around people, you're around family members that you don't want to be around, you know, that uncle that really convinced you a few years back, this is the best investment. It's going to go off the charts, except it totally tanked and you lost all of your savings and he hasn't made good on it. And now you have to see him. Or maybe it's your ex that you have to deal with at this time of year where they're trying, you know, that they kind of use this time of year to get into the kids' good graces, buying them all sorts of expensive presents and you can't afford that. And it just creates all sorts of tension. Or you got to go to that office party where you got to be around those people. You know, those people that really were speaking bad about you during the year. It's like, I don't want to be in these settings. And there's just a lot of heightened emotion. There's usually, you know, a lot of engagements that take place at Christmas. But there's a lot of breakups that take place at Christmas too. Isn't this true? It's just, isn't this jingle bells, isn't it all merry and bright? Don't you just feel wonderful? It will get better. But you know, this is where, this is where this whole thing of forgiveness, forgiveness might seem like it's the impossible gift to give. And that's actually okay. Because if we can, you know, if we just try to give forgiveness from our own good graces, what we're giving is probably not actually forgiveness. Because you can't just give forgiveness out of the goodness of your heart. We actually, as human beings, don't have that capacity in our human goodness to give forgiveness the way we're meant to give forgiveness to others. And that's where we need forgiveness. We need to learn how to re-gift this gift. And I really hope that sometime before we're done this afternoon, I really believe something is going to shift in our hearts. And even over the next couple of weeks as we go through this series, something is going to, I really believe God's going to shift something in us so that we really understand the power and the value of how to re-gift this amazing gift. So why is forgiveness so hard? Why is it so hard? I think C.S. Lewis really kind of nailed it when he said, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. Isn't that true? It's like you can be like, yeah, forgive, forgive. And then when it's in your face and you have to forgive, it's just like, oh, yeah, oh, well, yeah, yeah, there's, there's always an out. There's always a but. Isn't this true? And it's even doing a whole month-long series on this. This is a little bit scary because I know it will be a challenge in my own life. It's like, yeah, you can preach about forgiveness, but can you really do it? But you know what? Forgiveness is so hard for a couple reasons. And I think the first one is we either forget or we don't know the value of the gift of forgiveness that we've been given. You know, maybe you've never heard that through Jesus Christ, your sins have already been forgiven. That God has forgiven you. That he's not the big judge, meanie, bully out there somewhere in the sky ready to just hammer you when you've been wrong and when you've done wrong and make sure that you know all of the bad things you've done wrong and how you need to change. That's not what God is like. God's love came to us in Jesus Christ and he said, our sins have been forgiven in Jesus Christ. 
And even those of us that walk with Christ, maybe we maybe have known Jesus for a long time. It's easy to forget that, that what the value of the gift that we've been given. And so I want to look at a story that Jesus once told his disciples. He had just finished wrapping up a section with them. He was teaching them. And then Peter pipes up. He, Peter, it says, he got up the nerve to ask, Master, how many times do I need to forgive my brother or sister who hurts me? Seven? Now, when Peter threw out that number, that was like a really generous number according to Jewish tradition. And so Peter thought, like, I'm just being, I'm going to show that I am just the man. I am being really generous. Seven times, I'm ready to forgive seven times. And Jesus' response was, seven? Hardly. Try 70 times seven. Yeah, yikes is right. And then Jesus goes on to teach. He says, the kingdom of God is like a king who decided to square accounts with his servants. As he got underway, one servant was brought before him who had run up a debt of $100,000. Now, in the original language, this number represented the amount that a general laborer would make in 500 lifetimes. That is a lot of money. He couldn't pay up, and so the king ordered the man, along with his wife, children, and goods, to be auctioned off at the slave market. The poor wretch threw himself at the king's feet and begged, give me a chance, and I'll pay it all back. And touched by his plea, the king let him off, erasing the debt. The servant was no sooner out of the room when he came upon one of his fellow servants who owed him $10. He seized him by the throat and demanded, pay up now. The poor wretch threw himself down and begged, give me a chance and I'll pay it back. But he wouldn't do it. He had him arrested and put in jail until the debt was paid. Now, when the other servants saw this going on, they were outraged and brought a detailed report to the king. The king summoned the man and said, you evil servant, I forgave your entire debt when you begged me for mercy. Shouldn't you be compelled to be merciful to your fellow servant who asked for mercy? The king was furious and put the screws to the man until he paid back his entire debt. Now, another translation says he threw him, turned him over to the torturers. That's pretty brutal. And Jesus went on to finish. He said, and that's exactly what my father in heaven is going to do to each one of you who doesn't forgive unconditionally anyone who asks for mercy. Now, here's how this story relates to us. You and I are the first servant. We have been forgiven a massive, massive debt. We have no idea how big the debt of sin that we've been forgiven is. The the amount that we've been forgiven is beyond comprehension. Nothing ever done to us will ever be compared to what we have committed against God when it comes to our sin. Nothing. Nothing. Even the most horrible of things that have ever been committed, it doesn't compare to what we have been forgiven to God. Now that's hard words, especially if you've had terrible things done to you. And you could easily think, well, I've never done those things. I've never done that to anybody else and this was done to me. Are you saying that, you know, what what was done to me doesn't matter? No, this isn't about minimizing sin. This is about recognizing the fact that we gravely underestimate how bad our sin really is. We gravely underestimate how big our debt actually is. God has no rating scale when it comes to sin. God doesn't just, it's like, you know, our rating scale is, ah, it's a little white lie, and I can kind of slide that out of the carpet. Oh, it's just some supplies from the office. No one will really miss them. There's tons of stuff there. I'll just, you know, I just kind of sort of glance at the paper when I walked by and sat down to take my test. And, you know, I just, you know, I kind of thought, remembered what they wrote. down. Like, you know, what, those aren't really bad. But, you know, what, murder and, a, you know, child abuse, sex traffic, you know, all these things. That's really, really bad sins. You know what? God has no sin rating scale. It's all the same in his books. And so we underestimate how terrible our sin is. But So we're the first servant. But here's... We also hold the debts of others. Now, anytime someone hurts us, anytime someone betrays us, maybe they trash us and say horrible things about us. Maybe they treat us very, very wrongly. What they incur against us is called a debt. In scripture, that's how Jesus describes it. When someone else sins against us, it's a debt they have against us. They owe us. 
We are owed something for what was committed against us. And you know what? Here is the good news about what God has promised. You know, some people have a hard time with God. And if God is so good, why does he allow a whole bunch of horrible things to happen? Where is justice in that? You know what? God will bring justice. At some point he will. But we can, we can look at their debts. The question is, what will we do with their debts? That's the question. We hold the debts of others. What will we do with their debts? See, the king had servant number one. He had him, he had the servant freed from prison. He kept him out of prison, but yet the servant found himself back in the prison he'd been freed from because of his actions, because of his choices. And see, when we hold unforgiveness in our heart, we find ourselves back in the prison that we've been freed from. We find ourselves back in bondage to what God has freed us from. And see, it works like this. Let's say that I, well, first of all, what is debt? Debt is when I owe more than what I have to pay, right? So let's say I hire JD to mow my yard. He charges 20 bucks an hour and he does a really good job and it took him a whole hour to mow my yard because he likes doing all of the nice little lines and the cross cut. He does a phenomenal job and it's 20 bucks that I owe him except when I come to pay him, it's like, oh, JD, I only have 10 bucks on me. I got nothing else here. Sorry, there's nothing else in my wallet. There's no chain shaking loose. It's like empty. There's no, no money in here. It's empty. I am in debt to JD, Right? What is in here? Nothing. It's empty. And this is how it works with forgiveness and unforgiveness. See, if unforgiveness is where I hold on to the debts of others that have been committed against me, if this wallet represents debt, it's empty. There's nothing. What do I hold on to? I'm holding on to emptiness. Anytime I have forgiven unforgiveness in my heart, I'm holding on to something that will keep me in a perpetual place of lack. I will never find fulfillment in unforgiveness because it's a debt, it's emptiness. I can never find fulfillment. I'm hanging on to something that will only create more emptiness in me. It can never fulfill me. I see what's worse, if you think about just debt on a financial side of things, if I'm, if I'm counting, if I'm holding on to someone else's debt, but I was counting on their payment to me to pay my bills, what happens? I become a debtor now to the people that I was going to pay because I'm holding on to emptiness. I see, this is how unforgiveness works. This is what Jesus said. When you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. And so what is the solution? The solution is to forgive. It's saying, yes, you owe me, but I'm saying, no, you don't. I'm letting it go. I'm canceling your debt. And see, what we get in return is instead of hanging on to emptiness and lack and unfulfillment, what happens is what we get back, we get our lives back when we forgive we actually get released from the grudges and that burden of resentment. That resentment comes a heavy weight. And see, it's what Jesus said in Luke 6, 37 to 38, where he said, don't judge and you won't be judged. Don't condemn and you won't be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good portion, packed down, firmly shaken, overflowing, will fall into your lap. The portion you give will determine the portion you receive in return. Now, often we hear, if you've been in church any length of time, you hear that given it will be given back to you. It's usually a given, give money and you'll get more back, right? But the context that Jesus was teaching, he wasn't just talking about money currency. He was talking about relational currency. Don't judge. Don't condemn. Forgive and it will be given back to you. Whatever measure you give out in mercy and grace and forgiveness, you're going to get back. But you're not going to get back just what you received. You're going to get back more mercy. You're going to get back more grace because the picture is, when, you know, if you've ever tried to get, you know, if you 
try to fill up a container, you pour the stuff in and you shake it down and you pack it down so you can get more in. And then it overflows. This is a kind of measure of grace and mercy that we give when we release forgiveness to others. We get back so much more than what we give. Now, the second reason forgiveness is so hard is because we don't understand regifting etiquette when it comes to forgiveness. We don't understand regifting etiquette because we have mixed up ideas of what forgiveness is. See, forgiveness is not letting someone off the hook. Forgiveness isn't simply forgetting and just moving on. Because you know what? There's a, most of the things that we need to forgive, you can't just forget. They're stuck with you. And I think this is why we have such a hard time. We just think, well, I can't stop thinking about it. What's wrong? But forgiveness isn't just letting someone off the hook. See, the real power in forgiveness is how we remember what was done to us. See, will we remember, and when we think about what was done, will we remember with grace and mercy, or will we remember with bitterness and resentment? And see, the power of forgiveness isn't just letting them go. It's actually when we remember choosing to remember and turning that into a memorial of God's goodness. And we remember that with grace, and we remember it with kindness. We remember thinking about the mercy and kindness that was given to us. But when we remember, and we remember with b b bitterness or resentment, we actually turn that, instead of a memorial, that memory turns into a mountain of a huge, big grudge that we just carry through our lives. Forgiveness isn't letting someone off the hook. Forgiveness isn't simply ignoring a wrong and just, you know, moving on. You know, it's not just, okay, I'll just ignore them, or I'll ignore you. Ignoring them is not forgiving them. Ouch. But see, I can, I can move on and I can still be holding unforgiveness in my heart. Ignore, it's, it, forgiveness isn't treating sin lightly. See, we think, oh, if I, if, I, if I forgive them, then that's saying what they did. It's just, it's gone. It's okay. It's like, no, forgiveness isn't treating sin lightly. In fact, when we forgive the unforgivable, unforgivable that's committed against us, what we actually do is we highlight or we we actually show the powerful value, the great value of what Jesus Christ gave to forgive us. See, it cost Jesus everything to buy our forgiveness. It cost Jesus everything to pay our debt and to cancel our debt and to give us forgiveness. And anytime we forgive others, we're not treating sin lightly. We're just highlighting the good stuff. We're highlighting what Jesus did. Instead of emphasizing the bad and the sin, we highlight the amazing gift and the amazing thing that Jesus did for you and I. See, forgiveness is actually for us. Everyone say that forgiveness is for me. See what forgiveness means. Forgiveness means to let go of. It means to let go, to send away, to give up a debt by not demanding it. It means to leave behind. In other words, forgiveness, I drop it and I go. See, forgiveness is for me. It's me letting go of what was done to me. And unforgiveness is I'm hanging on to the sin of others. And see, every time we hold unforgiveness in our heart, what we're actually doing is we are exhuming. If you don't know what that word exhuming means, it means you go dig up a dead body that's been buried and you bring it back up. But we're exhuming what God has already judged and buried. See, when Jesus went on the cross, our sin, all of the sin that was committed against you, the betrayal of others, the abuse, the neglect, the hurtfulness, all of that, all of that was forgiven. All of that went on the cross when Jesus was crucified on the cross. All of that sin went into the grave. And when he rose again, all of that sin stayed in the grave. And he said, forgiven. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. And this is so hard to remember. We got to remember the people that mistreat us have been forgiven. God has already forgiven them. He's already left it in the grave. It is dead. It is buried. But if we hold on forgiveness, we are digging it back up and we're actually putting ourselves above God, saying that what you've judged is forgiven, dead, buried. No, I'm bringing it back up. And it wasn't what Jesus did. wasn't good enough. That's a scary place to be. And what happens when something's dead? It's full of decay. 
What happens with decayed stuff? It spreads to anything. It touches. You leave dead things laying around, it spreads. See, this is at the root. Why is our world in such a messed up place? Why do we read about crazy things happening in parts of the world? It's because the perpetual injustice just keeps going and going and going. And for centuries or even for millennium, it's this people group is mad at that people group. And they're digging up dead stuff and they're holding on to it. And the decay of that stuff just keeps spreading. It spreads to one generation. It spreads to another generation. It spreads to another generation. Why does things why is it that abuse seems to run in a family line? Why is it that addictions and all sorts of substance have seems to run in a family line? It's because dead stuff has been hung onto and that decay is spreading. What do you, what do, you do? You want to let go of the dead stuff. See, forgiveness is not about exonerating the perpetrator. It's about liberating the victim. See, forgiveness isn't just saying what they did wrong. No, forgiveness is about you. It's liberating the one that was mistreated. It's liberating the one that was betrayed. It's liberating the one that was hurt and was, and was abused. And see, forgiveness is for us because it frees us from what would destroy us. Forgiveness is actually our mission. And this is what Jesus commissioned his disciples with. When he rose from the grave, he came back and he spoke to the disciples the night after he had risen from the grave. And in John 20, 21 to 23, Jesus, he was saying to them, he said, I give you the gift of peace. In the same way that the Father sent me, I am now sending you. See, Jesus wasn't just talking to these 12 guys, or 11, I guess, was at the time. He was talking to you and I. I am sending you. And now Jesus, he drew close enough to each of them that they could feel his breath. And he breathed on them and said, welcome the Holy Spirit of the living God. You now have the mantle of God's forgiveness. You now have the mantle of God's forgiveness. As you go, you're able to share the life-giving power to forgive sins or to withhold forgiveness. This is so powerful. When Jesus imparted the Holy Spirit, it wasn't just to go do a whole bunch of cool healing miracles, to raise the dead, or to do anything else, other amazing kind of things. He gave the Holy Spirit to his disciples so that they could live forgiven and so that they could bring the message of forgiveness to others. I love that. The most awesome thing, God gives us his spirit so we can forgive. He gives us his spirit so we can declare to others, you are forgiven. And see what Jesus, he said, when, when you withhold forgiveness, he said, if you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. If you don't forgive sins, what are you going to do with them? See, Jesus accomplished complete forgiveness at the cross. That is the reality. That is the reality. All of our sin forever, all time was left in the grave. He rose again. And when Jesus rose from the grave, what he brought was a whole new way of doing life. It's called sins forgiven. This is how you can live now. And see, this was the message that he gave his disciples to go out and to take and to carry out. And this is our message that we can go and we can take to others. It's like, this is a reality. You don't have to live as this broken person. You don't have to live with these grudges. You don't have to live with the guilt and the shame. You have been forgiven. Now live like it. Take this message. See, our message isn't, Jesus didn't send the disciples to go out and go out and make sure you tell everybody how bad they are and how much they need to repent and get their crap in order. No, he said, this is your reality. Forgiven, forgiven forgiven, forgiven, you're forgiven. See, here's the thing about the cross. Does that mean even everything that all my future sins are forgiven? Yes, because when Jesus died, all of your current sins were in the future anyway. Think about it. It was all in the future anyway. Forgiven. Does that mean we go out and we can do whatever we want? No, that's called stupid. You don't purposely grow out and go out and create debt to others. We live forgiven. There's power in that. And this is our mission, to live in this and to bring this message to others. You've been forgiven. You've been forgiven. I want us to stand. I want to pray. I want you to close your eyes. See this, forgiveness is an absolutely crazy way to live. It makes zero sense. Justice, restitution, payback, that makes sense but 
when we live that way, we simply hang on to dead stuff. We put ourselves in a place above God and saying what he's already judged is forgiven, and I know it's not. But see, God has freed every single one of us. I see to experience the reality that your sins are forgiven. That's the reality of your life. But you might not be experiencing that reality because we experience it by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. Not our faith in our strength and our ability to work hard and be good and to do better and to be a really kind and generous person. No, I put my faith in what Jesus has done, not in what I can do. And, you know, right now we're going to pray a prayer because there's some, there's some here I know that you, you're, you, you feel very disconnected from God. You're far from God. Maybe you've never thought about a personal relationship with God. You know what? He is so wanting to have a relationship with you. He wants to know how much, he wants you to know how much he loves you. And this prayer that we're all going to pray out loud together is a prayer of saying yes to Jesus. Beginning a brand new start. It's what puts you, it's what brings your life into the reality of forgiven, accepted to God, loved beyond measure. And I want all of us with our eyes closed, let's pray this. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Thank you for rising from the grave and leaving my sin in the grave. Thank you for coming to a, coming alive in a new life. Thank you that this new life is for me today. And I say yes to this gift. I say yes to a brand new start. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God praise this afternoon. Can we do that? God, we thank you. God, we are so thankful for the people here in this room, for the people online. You know, maybe you're watching this online and you prayed that prayer for the first time. You know what? Something new is happening. God is real and he does something brand new inside of us. And we're all going to pray. We're all going to pray now. One more prayer together. And you know what? I want you to close your eyes because there is going to be a real significant thing that takes place for some here today. You're going to be released from some weights that you've been carrying for a long time. You're going to be released from that prison. You're going to be released from that decay that's just been spreading through your life. And you can't quite, why do my relationships, why do they all seem to be so sour? Why do they just seem to not go anywhere? Why are they always such a disappointment? I'm a disappointment to myself. You know what? It's because we're hanging on to dead stuff. I know that God wants to free you today from this area, from whatever it is, whoever you need to release the debt of. And I want you to pray with me. Say, Jesus, thank you for forgiving me. And right now I choose to forgive. And I want you to quietly speak those names out. Say, God, I forgive them. I want you to say, I let go of their debt. I release them. And I thank you, Father, for freedom today. In Jesus' name. Father, right now, I just declare your freedom. Father, those that came in, Father, with just so much stuff, so much weight or feeling. Father, those that have been in prison for so long, the prison of unforgiveness. Father, I just declare your freedom right now. Father, freedom from those, Father, the, the situations, that the memories that are just so painful. God, the freedom from, Father, the disappointment, the freedom from the hurt and the pain. And Father, those things that have been buried for so many years that I haven't told anybody about. God, we just declare freedom today to people. Father, your liberating power, Father, that comes when we forgive and we choose to let go of the debts of others. God, we declare that freedom today for your people in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Yeah, we got to cheer. Yes. Get excited about this. You got to just look. You know what? When it comes up, you think about them again. It's just like, ah, I thought I forgave them. It's like, you know, I release them. I release it. I release it. I'm not hanging on to their debt anymore. 